to come to the podium and recite holy quran and present its english translation brother shamshir Yeah. 
My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu Alaikum. On behalf of Islamic Propagation Center of New York, I welcome you all and appreciate your presence at tonight's program. We all together, from the bottom of our hearts, Welcome the Honorable Chief Guest, Brother Ahmad Didar, who traveled from South Africa to North America on our invitation. Brother, Brother Ahmad Didar, through your unique techniques of debating and excellent style of lecturing, you have given a new dimension to the program of Islamic propagation. The entire Muslim Ummah admires you, loves you and holds you in high regard. May Allah give you high reward in this world and in the hereafter. Amen. Brother Ahmad Dida, you will be delighted to know that your brilliant student, Brother Hamza Abdul Malik, 
has been following your approach in the propagation of Islam in this United States. Last summer, he had a very successful debate at Pennsylvania University. And inshallah, he will be having more and he will be successful. Brother Didai, you have created a space for new da'is. You have given a new inspiration to these da'is to communicate the message of Islam to the entire mankind in the contemporary world. Your beloved student, Brother Hamza Abdul Malik, has been doing this job excellently. He has been teaching Islam, he has been teaching comparative religion classes at Masjid Al Fatima for the past two years. The Islamic Propagation Center of New York has been paying him nothing, no cash, no kind. The reward for his services lies with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. قال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم فَآتَمَهُمُ اللَّهُ سَوَابَ الدُّنْيَا وَحُسْنَ سَوَابَ الْآخِرِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُسْنِينَ The reward for good people who are doing good lies with Allah. Reward in this world and an excellent reward in the hereafter. Now I strongly feel that the new generation of da'is is very much anxious or rather eager to have their graduation certificates at the same time to receive the inspirational message from Sheikh Ahmad Didar. So I will not like to stay here more, but before I leave the floor, I would like to con congratulate all those who graduated from our center this year and in previous years. I also thank the chief guest, Brother Didat, and his close associate, Brother Saleh Muhammad, who is sitting behind him, beside him, for making this program a momentous and a memorable event. May Allah guide us and help us in following Islam according to the prescription given in Holy Quran and according to the tradition of Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. May Allah give us tawfiq to communicate the message of Islam to the entire mankind. Ameen. Now with this brief introduction, I would request Brother Hamza to come and talk to you. Thank you, Brother. It's not a gun. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Muslim wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Wa ma'u'idatul hasana. وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِيهِ يَا أَحْسَنُ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ هُوَ عَقْلُمُ بِمَنْ دَالَ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ وَهُوَ عَقْلُمُ بِالْمُقْتَدِينَ أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Mr. Chairman Distinguished leaders and scholars Brothers and sisters in Islam and in humanity let me first express my deep appreciation to the Islamic Propagation Center International of Queens, New York, to Brother Akil Khan and his associates of the IPCI for their far-sighted vision in conceiving and carrying out the plans for this gathering here tonight. I would like also to extend a most cordial welcome to those who have traveled long distances to honor us with their presence. 
I am particularly grateful that not only our distinguished scholar, Sheikh Ahmed Didak, but also one who has no claim to scholarly attainment has been included in, in the in invitation to stand before you tonight, that one being yours truly. That we have been summoned here tonight on this most auspicious occasion argues well for its success now and in its impact in the future, inshallah. There could be no better advocation for a person than to call men to Allah's way and to conform his or her conduct to the teachings that he or she preaches to others and to submit themselves entirely to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the essence of Islam uh, I had been thinking about what to say to our students they've seen me so many hours standing before them in our classrooms and uh, I was thinking tonight since we have our great scholar Sheikh Ahmed Didat here with us what should be my talk tonight uh, and alhamdulillah that during the past week an incident occurred that I think would say it all once I convey it I think it will deliver just what I could probably uh, like to say what I would like to say to my students and to our guests tonight. While uh, I had went, my wife and I had went up to the school on this day that they call Halloween here in New York. Uh, I had went up to pick up my kids from school early that evening because of the uh, uh, behavior of some of the school kids on this particular day after school. So to keep my kids from being bothered or even bothering other people for that matter, I said, well, let's go get the kids out of school earlier and wait for them and bring them home rather than let them take public transportation. So my wife and I, while we were waiting in front of the school there, uh, this is a junior high school here in Queens, New York, in Queens, and while we were parked there, sitting in my uh, van, which has tinted windows, and you can't really see in there, uh, there were some teenagers on the corner in front of the school peddling, selling X-rated movies, X-rated movies, to the uh, students as they came out of school, X-rated movies. And uh, one of them seen the van pull up, and so they walked up to the van to present one to whoever they felt was sitting in the passenger side of the van. They wanted to see if you want to, you're interested in buying one of these X-rated movies. And not being able to see through the window, they didn't know who they were talking to, so they presented it. And as he didn't get any response, he moved on a little further in front of the van at that point, you could see through the clear window, the windshield portion. And so now this individual happened to see uh, myself sitting on the driver's side with a white, what we call a kufi on, a white headdress, white headdress. And right away, he recognized his mistake. He knew that he was peddling his wares uh, in a condition that they were not they wouldn't, they wouldn't be accepted. And he, re he realized that he had made a mistake. So right away, this individual went to his buddy, to his partner, and told him immediately what he had done. And the big mistake that he, you can see the expression, what he had done and what mistake he had made by trying to sell X-rated movies to Muslim or to Muslims. And the friend, the friend approached the van and began to make apologies for his buddy. He began to apologize. No one said anything, nothing at all. This is just spontaneous action uh, occurring. He began to apologize for the mistake and for the intrusion of his friend, and they walked away. And not only that, but they left the area altogether now. They just left the whole area altogether. 
So that impressed me and, and, and gave me a good idea now in terms of giving dawa. When we talk about inviting and calling people to the way of Allah, uh, that giving dawa is more than just uh, becoming scholarly, uh, having a lot of uh, good words to say to people, but also our conduct. Our conduct as Muslims play a great role in giving dawa. And we'd be surprised now that by identifying ourselves, and my point is this, and I don't mean to, uh, by the statements that I'm going to make, uh, belittle anybody or embarrass anybody. I just simply want to say particularly to those students who engage in uh, dawa training, that they want to make themselves uh, uh, examples of people who invite to the way of Allah, that these Muslims, men and women, should in their conduct display uh, the character of the dawa or the message that they would like to invite to. Also, keeping that in mind, a verse from the Quran uh, in chapter Surah 33 of the Quran, uh, verse 59, there it says in the translation, O Prophet, tell thy wives and the daughters and the believing women that they should cast their outer garments over their person when abroad. That is most convenient that they should be known as such, meaning as believing women, and not be molested. And Allah is often forgiving, most merciful. Two points come to mind in this verse, and that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing the Prophet وسلم, that he enjoin upon his wives and the believing women that when they go out abroad, venture out of their per, uh, private domain, that they conduct themselves in a certain manner, that they dress in a certain manner for two reasons, main reasons, and that is that they not be given trouble, they not be molested, they not be harassed in the society because they're not displaying their uh, beauty, flaunting their beauty, so that therefore they're not given trouble and also that they can be recognized, recognized as believing women. And this is my point, the point of being recognized in this society, that we as Muslim men and women, we can give dawah by being recognized, by being recognized as believing men and women. It's just like the police officer. The police officer, unless he's got some undercover work that he's trying to do, he's recognized. So when you see the police officer approaching, he's recognized, he identifies himself, and right away you want to escape from whatever it is that you're plotting or planning or doing. Uh, the fireman, when he comes out to do his job, he's recognized. The doctor, when he approaches you in the office, he's recognized. And so therefore, it's a good practice of us as Muslims to have some identification, uh, especially in our clothing, in our dress. Regard, and I'm not in, uh, saying that there's any particular manner of dress now, particularly for men. The women's position in Islam is known. But for us brothers in Islam, that we, in, especially in a society like uh, the West, in America, that we should identify ourselves, that we can be known, that our brothers can know uh, each other, and that at the same time others can know and perhaps inquire of us, why do you wear this, who are you, what are you, what is your religion, and this gives us a chance to enter into a dialogue. I just hope that by relating that particular incident, and I'm sure many of you have uh, similar inc incidents that you could refer to that this would inspire you in that area. And uh, before I close, I don't want to speak too much, but before finishing, I would consider it uh, my pleasure and my duty on behalf of the IPCI and on behalf of the students of the IPCI, the Islamic Propagation Center International, uh, that we thank our beloved brother, Sheikh Ahmed Didat, our, be our beloved brother and teacher, Sheikh Ahmed Didat. We all are most grateful to you that you have very graciously come here to be with us tonight. And the fact that you have been kind enough 
to interrupt your busy schedule to come here shows the importance that you attach to this work that we're doing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless all of us who strive in his cause and that he gives us victory over the non-belief. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Hamza Malik, Jazakallah Khair. Now I request Brother Ahmad Didar, Sheikh Al Islam, to come to the podium and deliver his inspiring message. Sheikh Ahmad Didar. Allahu Akbar walillahi alham. Allahu Akbar walillahi alham. Allahu Akbar walillahi alham. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولن ترضى أنك اليهود ولا النصارى حتى تتبع ملتهم صدق الله صدق الله العظيم Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters I read to you a very short verse from the Holy Quran from Surah Al-Baqarah Ayah number 120. In it, Allah Bari Ta'ala, God Almighty, He gives us the eternal relationship existing between the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims. He tells us, وَلَن تَرْضَى أَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَى Hatta tattabi'a millatahum That the Jews and the Christians will never, never be satisfied with you, O Muslims, unless you follow their brand of religion. In other words, there's no peace. They won't be satisfied. Now mind what you say, how much you bend backwards to appease them, you will not be able to satisfy them. For example, we in the House of Islam, we tell the Christians that we believe in Jesus, one of the mightiest messengers of God. We Muslims, we believe in his miraculous birth, that he was born without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians, even including the Anglican bishops, they do not believe today. The Christian bishops don't believe, but we Muslims, we believe that Jesus Christ was born without any male intervention. We believe that he was the Messiah. We believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission and he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. Does that satisfy them? No. This is unless you join the church. And each and every church won't be satisfied until you join his particular church. If you become a Roman Catholic, the Protestants are not happy. If you become a Jehovah's Witness, all the rest of the Christians are not happy. If you become a Seventh-day Adventist, the others are not happy. How can you make them happy? I want to know. But you have to follow their particular brand of religion to make them happy, which is an impossibility. So we keep on repeating that we believe in this mighty messenger of God mm, to no avail. The Jews, they said to the Muslims in the early days, they said, you Muslims, there is no heaven for you, unless you become a Jew. And the Christians said the very same thing. There is no heaven for you, unless you become a Christian. All your good deeds, the Christian will say, are like dirty rags, worthless rubbish. You fast and you pray, you go for Hajj, you straight jacket your lives, you don't drink, you don't gamble, you don't date, you don't court, but you go to hell. <laughs> because salvation is the exclusive preserve. Because they say, Christ died for the sins. Who died for yours? 
who died for your sins? Do you know it's one of the most ridiculous questions anybody can ask? Who died for your sins? It's just like asking you, who eats for you when you're hungry? When you have a headache, who takes the pill for you? When you have a rotten appendix, who gets operated on your behalf? This is silly, silliest question in the world, but that guy tantalizes the Muslims when he asks you who died for your sins. And the Muslim starts thinking, yes, who? And you can't find anybody. They will not be satisfied with you. No matter what you do, how much back would you bear? The Jews, they have fallen out of the race of wanting to convert us. They will be satisfied if we will acknowledge the right to Palestine. They robbed us of our lands, our brethren of the land, at the point of the gun. And now if you are happy with them, they will be happy with us. If we, as long as you keep on crying for your land, they will not be satisfied. Now this battle is going on for the past 1400 years. And I, as an Indian Muslim, I felt it. This confrontation during the days of our history, Muslim history in India. You see, when the British, when they conquered India, they realized that any time anybody will give them trouble, it will be the Muslims. Because power, rule, dominion was rent out of their hands, and they were a far more militant community than the Hindus of the time. They were then as docile as the cows that they were worshipping. There was no fear from that quarter. The Muslim was the problem. And they felt that if we can convert these people, teach them to turn the other cheek. You know, Jesus Christ said, if a person strikes you on the right cheek, give him the other. Teach the Muslim to do that, then we can rule India for a thousand years. That was the master plan. Convert them, and they are all yours for a thousand years. So they started pouring in the missionaries, like frogs in the rainy season. I don't know whether you have frogs in this country. You have frogs here? Yes. I don't know. Some countries they don't have frogs, it's too dry. However, like frogs in the rainy season. And they started challenging the Muslims to public debates. Now I'm reading this in a book written about a hundred years ago by an Arab gentleman who was trying to help the Indian Muslims as to how to give battle to the Nasara. A book called Izharul Haq, The Truth Revealed. So I'm reading this book and this tells me that these British missionaries, they were challenging the Muslims to public debates. At first the Muslims were reluctant, naturally, because these people had just conquered our land, and if you speak too militantly, too hard, too strong, they might send us to the Andaman Islands, they call them the Black Waters, or like the Robben Island in South Africa, if you talk too much, you go there. So, mum is the word. Keep out of trouble. And number two, our people, our learned men, they didn't know English. So how can you have a debate with the people who are speaking foreign language. You can't. You speak Urdu, that guy speaks English. How can you debate? So the Christian missionaries, something we have to credit them, the genius of the Western world, that wherever they go, whatever country they go to, they learn the language of the native. They take a crash course and within three months they speak your language. They come to Zululand, they learn Zulu. They go to Pakistan, they learn Urdu. They go to Malaysia, they learn Malaysian. Wherever they go, they master the language of the native. So these people, British, according to the tradition, they mastered the language of Urdu. And now they started telling the Muslims to debate in Urdu. What excuse have you got now? So the younger generation forced a Maulana Abdul Aziz of Delhi, Maulana Abdul Aziz Dahlavi, means of Delhi, said, look, Maulana Sahib, respected Maulana, these people are challenging as our own mother tongue. There's no retreat. So this Maulana was forced to accept the challenge. A certain reverend founder 
who was the head of this missionary work in India at the time, he issued the challenge and the challenge was accepted and the debate takes place in Delhi. It is reputed that a hundred thousand people gathered. There were no mic systems there, no loudspeakers. I don't know how voice traveled those days. But it didn't matter. Because the bulk of the people, they can hear, see these two giants, they're having it out and they have their own commentaries to make as to what the Maulana said or did and what the Reverend said or did and there was satisfaction enough. So the Reverend starts the ball rolling by suggesting to the Maulana, Maulana means the priest, our Islamic Muslim priest, Maulana Sahib means respected Maulana, get started with the debate. So the Maulana, he said, you see, you are our elder brother, who the Christian, because Christianity precedes Islam by 600 years. Christianity is 600 years before Islam. So as such, you are our elder brother. And according to our culture, you have the first preference. Number two, you are our guest. No doubt an unwelcome guest, but a guest at that. And according to our tradition, you have the first preference. So the reverend was forced to start. And he started with a question. They pose a riddle. He says, Maulana Sahib, respected Maulana, like a bishop, like a priest, respected, sir. Where is your prophet Muhammad now, now, this minute? So the Maulana thought for a moment and he said that he is in Jannatul Firdaus, heavenly bliss with God Almighty. Out of that answer came the second question. It was planned. He said, all right, all right. Tell us now, Maulana Sahib. Where was your prophet Muhammad when his grandson Hussein was martyred at Karbala? Killed, murdered, slain. Where was he then? See, the Maulana thought again for a moment. And he answered. He said, he was still in Jannatul Firdaus, heavenly bliss with God Almighty. Out of that answer came the third question. He said, all right, all right. Now tell us, Maulana Sahib, respected Maulana, that if your Prophet was with his Allah in heaven, when his grandson Hussein was being martyred, killed, butchered, didn't he ask his Allah for help? So, oh my Lord, look what they're doing to my grandson. Please help him out of his difficulty. Didn't he ask Allah for help? And there was a pause, a long pause. And the priest couldn't hold his patience. He started stamping his feet. Come on, come on. Didn't he ask his Allah for help? I mean, if you have a big brother, somebody coming along bullying you, won't you ask for his help? He said, brother, look at this guy, what is he doing to me? He is God Almighty, by your side. And you have access to him. Would he not ask? Did he or didn't he ask his Allah for help? So after some pause, the Maulana says, he did. He did. Uh, it's a natural thing to do. He says, yes, he did. So what did he say? What did you Allah say? And there was an inordinate pause, a very, very long pause. And the priest still started once more banging his feet. Come on, come on. What did he say? So the Maulana started slowly. He said, Allah cried. You know, cried. Allah cried. So what? Allah cried? He said, yes, Allah cried. He said, I couldn't save my own son, Jesus. How can I save your grandson? <laughs> The debate was over. <laughs> this has got nothing to do with truth or falsehood. You see, this is called, you know, tit for tat. If somebody catches you out, you catch him out. It has got nothing to do with facts. The truth or falsity of a thing, no. It's just 
you trying to be too clever the other man tries to be a little cleverer than you that's all the debate was over but uh, this was the type of confrontations that were taking place you know, in the early days another incident i read about in the same book about another arab sheikh a ruler small prince a christian missionary got stuck into him day in and day out he visits this this sheikh this ruler wanting to convert him to christianity trying to save him from hell fire salvation salvation and he's pestering the life out of him and he persevered he wouldn't let go this is a great quality is a fantastic quality that the christian has if he sees some little weakness on your part he will never let you go if you give him your finger he'll catch you by the hand the muslim gets satisfied you see he has an argument a little confrontation and in the argument he beats the christian and is happy i did it you know the jehovah's witnesses they don't come near my door anymore he's happy i said you know that guy wouldn't be happy with you if he just had notice any little weakness on your part that guy would have taken the life out of you he would have persevered till he knocked you into jehovah's witnessism or you tell him next time i see your face down the door i'll put a bullet through you either way he wouldn't let you go but the muslim gets satisfied very very easily satisfied i beat the fellow <laughs> he doesn't see me anymore he doesn't come anyway he takes he walks on the other side of the road now I said you are a fool man if you did that what you ought to have done when the guy comes into your house take his name and address first and his telephone number if he doesn't want to give you push him out he doesn't deserve to be in your house he is like a rogue he is a thief a man comes to your house and you ask him may i know your name he doesn't give you his name your address he doesn't give you his address your telephone number he doesn't give you his telephone number what do you do with a person like he is a thief he is a thief in the night you kick him out if the man cooperates with you take these things down and after discussion you will find that the guy says all right i'll come and see you again he doesn't come to see you follow him up you phone him you pester the life out of him you don't let go the christian will let you go look but the muslim is satisfied you know the guy says i put chase him away and he doesn't come back anymore hmm. so this christian missionary got stuck into this arab sheikh and no peace how to get out of this difficulty he is courteous they are very courteous people and our hospitality is getting the better of us as well you see the muslim is ever hospitable anybody comes along he says welcome that guy has come to steal your your deen your faith to pervert you but ahlan wa sahlan is a family and play come this is the muslim mentality wherever anywhere in the world but that gets a better of him because the other guy is making nest in his head and he allows it in general he allows it so this sheikh he didn't know what to do how to get out of the difficulty he so he he works out a plan he tells one of his ministers is a look next time this guy comes along i want you to come and whisper something in my ears okay so okay and the guy is there next morning assalam alaikum ya sheikh assalam alaikum sada and he starts you know christ died for your sins he died for your sins salvation does not come through any other way except by the blood of the lord jesus he started his old story same story and there comes this minister whispers something into the sheikh's ears and the sheikh starts to cry like a woman who has lost her husband <laughs> so what's wrong what's wrong the priest is asking what is it i can't tell you so what is he telling me i can sympathize with you so no you can't and he is more interested to know why are you crying so bitterly so he is forced eventually to say that i just got the sad news so what sad news he said that the archangel gabriel his mamma mamma is dead the angel archangel gabriel 
the Holy Ghost is dead. He says, don't be fool. He says, the angels don't die. Says the priest. So the sheikh says, and you fool, you're telling me that God died? <laughs> Jesus Christ is God. He must die as a God. One man can't carry the sins of the world. You know that? A man, one man, look, he can't. How can he carry the sins of the whole of mankind from Adam to eternity? He must be a God. So they say he died as a God. Because as a man you can't carry sins. One man can't carry sins. Very well. Everybody sins. Billions and billions of people. So he must be a God. So he must die as a God. So I said, you fool, you said that God died. <laughs> this was over. But now, these are old stories. These are old stories. The Christians have developed new techniques. And they're harassing our people all over the world. Now they come to you, they are now more sophisticated. They come to the Muslims, as Jesus said, like wolves in sheep's clothing. They come to you like lambs. Wolves in the guise of lambs. And they start with you. Kiachi brother, what's your name? Hamza, what's your name? Mr. Khan, what's your word? He says, can I have a few minutes with you? Ah, the Muslim is so ever hospitable, he says, come, come, welcome, sit down. Order some tea and some samosas. This proverbial hospitality. Even if the guy has come to take his life, he orders some tea and samosas, he says, come, sit down. So now the Christian starts. It's a new technique now. He said, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? You, you, you. You don't? You are not a Muslim. He said, brother of there, our sister says, no. <laughs> you better reconvert him. <laughs> you can't be a Muslim, Wallah. You say you don't believe in Jesus, you are not a Muslim. Maybe you didn't know the implication, you didn't understand, you didn't grasp it. The Muslim must say, yes, we believe in Jesus. He says, you know, he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. What do you say? What do you say? Yes. We must be honest. Look, you must ever be honest. Hazrat Isa says something very beautiful. He said, seek ye the truth and the truth shall make you free. At any time, anybody, whatever question the man poses to you, Give the straight true answer. Don't be afraid to get caught. Even if he's sticking to your slaughter, to the hangman's noose, cooperate with him. Wallah, this is what man must do. Truth! Whatever you recognize as truth, you accept, you accept, you accept. Where he's taking you, that's not your business. You have to speak the truth. You believe that he's, he, is, he was born miraculously? He said yes. That's what the Quran testifies. He was born without any male intervention. Jesus Christ. Yes. You know he was the Messiah, Masih, translated Christ. So we accept. We accept. He says, you know, he gave life to the dead. What do you say? Yes. It's Allah with the permission of Allah. So whatever he says, the Muslim cooperates. He's got to cooperate because this is his faith. So now he's posing you, changing the manner of his questioning. He said, you said that Jesus was born miraculously without any male intervention. He says, I believe. I believe. He said, was Muhammad so born? You're Muhammad. Was he born like that? Without a father? No. He had a father and a mother. He said, yes. So, one degree higher up for Jesus. See, your prophet had a father and a mother, Jesus had only a mother. One degree higher. He doesn't tell you that, but he's proved it. He says, you know, Jesus was Masihullah, Allah's Messiah. Translated Christ. You accept that? Yes. Allah tells you in the Holy Quran, Masihu is Ibn Maryam. Messiah, Masih, Jesus, Christ, the son of Mary. 
We accept. Was Muhammad Masihullah? Right. See, a brother said he was Rasulullah. See, yes. It's not Masihullah in the Quran, it's Rasulullah. Yes. But Isa is Rasul and Masih. Do you know that? Yes. So he's got two degrees. Hmm, it's two degrees higher. Your Prophet is only Rasul, his is Rasul and Masih. Two degrees. Another degree of Jesus. He says, you know, Jesus gave life to the dead. Did your prophet give life to the dead? No. no. Another degree of Jesus. See what's happening. Say, so where is your prophet Muhammad? Where is he now? Yes, where is he? Buried in Medina. Yes. Where is Jesus? He's in heaven. He's coming back. Say, so, yes. Your prophet is dead and buried in Medina. Jesus is here in heaven and is coming back. Now don't you think God had a purpose in doing all that? You think he did for nothing? You do things for nothing? You just make kurbani? You know Bakri we had? Idul Adha? You made a sacrifice? Sheep or goat or cow? I don't know what you do here. But you make kurbani? And when you do kurbani according to the teachings of Islam, you look for an animal without blemish? Horn not broken, ear not cut, not blind, not limping, right? Yes. So if God Almighty wants to make a sacrifice for His creation, is He going to look for second best? You look for second best? No. Then will Allah look for second best? No. And He's proved to you who is second best. Who? Your prophet. Come and argue with Him now. Debate with Him. These are new, new methods. You know, one life, it is so easy and so childish, the whole thing. But, because you are not in the field. You are not in the field. You don't know what are the implications of what the guy is talking about. So, you are being led to the slaughter, and he's going to slaughter you. He's slaughtering other people. See, the ordinary people, the simple people, they cooperate. And they get slaughtered because they don't know what are the implications of all this. They say Jesus was born miraculously. So what? So what? Does that make him superior to Muhammad? He says yes. But I says, look man, according to this standard of yours, if that makes Jesus God and the Son of God because he has got no earthly father, then Adam is a greater God. The Quran tells us very simple reasoning, logic. The similitude or the example of Jesus in the sight of Allah is like that of Adam. He made him from dust. And he said, be and he was. So if Jesus is God, or the son of God because he's got no father then Adam is a greater God and a greater son of God because he's got no father and no mother will you stand by that? no the guy won't accept that I said, what's wrong with you? if Jesus makes him great because he's got no mother then Adam has got no mother and no father who is superior? Adam you worship him why don't you worship Adam? Oh, but you see, he was created from dust, says the Christian. He said, what about Melchizedek? In the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, you read there, in the Christian Bible, it's Melchizedek, the high priest of Salah, without father, without mother, without beginning, without end. I'm only reading what Paul wrote, without father, without mother. Without beginning, without end. Melchizedek, the high priest of Salah. I'm asking who is greater, Jesus or Melchizedek? See, Jesus had a, father, a mother. This man got no father and no mother. Who is superior? Jesus had a beginning in the stable. Every Christian testifies to that. Every Christmas they remind themselves, born in the stable to a Jewish girl. Right? He had a beginning and he had an apparent end. They say he died on the cross. He had a beginning, he had an apparent end. This man, no beginning, no end. Who is greater? Majesty God Jesus. 
come on and stand to reason. No, the guy lies. He, he wants to get out. He's got other appointments. He must run. No, the thing is, you have to do a little bit of homework. The problem with us is that we are too damn lazy. You do nothing. See, your tasbih won't help you. Subhanallah, subhanallah. That won't help you here. This is a different thing. You do your fall, Allah will reward you. He won't question you on the day of judgment. Why didn't you make salah? Because you did. That won't save you from this. This is a different thing altogether. You have to do a little bit of homework. And Brother Hamza is, is carrying on classes here. I don't know how much he's charging. I didn't have a chance to ask him, Allah. What do you charge, brother? <laughs> brother Hamza Malik tells me it's free. I think it's for that reason you don't value it. Mufat ka muskamal, anything you get for nothing, you don't value it. So he said, you see, Jesus is Christ, Masih, Masih, and Ras Rasul. Your prophet is only Rasul. That's what it appears to be. So he said, look, man, what is Masih, Masih? The Christian is programmed to think that means God. He is God. I said, look, the Jews were not waiting, they were waiting for a Messiah, Masih. They were not waiting for a God, man God. The Jews were not waiting for any man gods to come down from heaven. This Messiah, Messiah was a title, meaning the anointed one. The anointed one is the appointed one. When God appoints a person, we say he is anointed by God, means that he is appointed by God. He is authoritative, true messenger of God. And as such, every prophet of God is Messiah, Messiah appointed. Allah appoints his messengers. He chooses his messengers. Musa alayhi salam was chosen by God, Moses. As such, he was a Rasul and a Masih. But we don't say that. You see, in human language, certain attributes, certain qualities, we specifically apply to a certain person. Like, I don't know you people, what history you people read. Uh, under British system, I had lived in British colonies, all my life, at school and the British system, they taught us about Alfred the Great. He was one of the English kings who burned the cake. Alfred the Great who burned the cake. I said, Alfred was the Great. Alfred the Great. That's what they say, Alfred the Great. Why? Made him great, he burned the cake. So made him great. No. No, just the title, they gave him Alfred the Great. I said, what about all the other kings, all, all puny kings? No, they were also great, but this guy has got the title. Richard the Lionhearted. What's the name? Richard the Lionhearted. He went to give battle to Saladin, the Crusades. Richard the Lionheart. I said, all your other English kings were chicken hearted. <laughs> they said, no. I said, but why is this only this one lion hearted? What happened about the others? All chicken hearted. So no, no. But this, they were they were what what is it? No, this is how. You give names. You give certain types. In the house of Islam, you speak about Kalimullah. If you learn, know the language, know something about theology, religion, Kalimullah. I'm asking, who is Kalimullah? Musa. Musa. Means the Prophet Moses. What does Kalimullah mean? One who spoke with God. What about the other prophets? Didn't Jesus speak with God? So, yes, yes. Did Musa, Dawud didn't they speak with God? He said, yes. Suleiman didn't they speak with God? He said, yes. Muhammad didn't they speak with Allah? He said, yes. But they're all Kalimullah. But when you say Kalimullah, you're only thinking of Musa. Khalilullah. Who's Khalilullah? Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Beautiful. I'm very happy with your responses. <laughs> no, no. Fine. Because otherwise you put me to shame. I said, look, these Muslims is that they don't know anything. <laughs> No, Ibrahim is Khalilullah. Khalilullah means a friend of God. Ibrahim means Prophet Abraham. The father of the Jews, the Christians and the Muslims, father of us all. Abraham. He is in the house of Islam called Khalilullah. He is the friend of God. What about all the others? Are any Allah's enemies? Hmm? Jesus is his enemy? 
No, Musa is his enemy. This is titles you give. You say Rasulullah. Who is Rasulullah? Yes, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi What about Isa? Is it not Rasul? Yes. Musa is not Rasul? Yes. But when you say Rasulullah, you only think of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi No, this is how you are used to thinking. But once you know, you find it so easy to respond. But when you don't, he is making rings around you. He is making nests in your head. He is stealing your children. Because you don't do homework. Now for this homework, you don't have to join the class. Brother Hamza's class, there are books available. Booklets. And each and every booklet is a masterpiece. Little things. Little things, 12 pages. Won't go to the, that Baptist church. Because this one here, there is no dancing, that one allows dancing. That one there, does allow dancing, but no singing. And so on, you know. <laughs> Forty different Baptist churches. I don't know how many more now, I don't know. But, so you are asking, they are asking one another all the time, what church you belong to? What church you belong to? So that's the same question you ask. What church you belong to? So if they give you a name, any name, you never heard the name in your life before. Mennonite. I don't know whether you heard it. Mennonite. It's a church. Yeah, originating in America. Mormon. Church. Christadelphian. Church. Episcopalian. Church. Now, man, whatever. If he gives you a name in response to your question, he is your customer. Unless he tells you I'm a Jew, he's a different type of customer. He says I'm an atheist, he's a different type of customer. But he's also your customer. So he gives you a name, any name, you never heard it before in your life. In response to your question, what church you belong to, and he tells you Mennonite. Right. He is your customer. Anything he tells you, whether you grasp it or not, he is your customer. So you ask him a second question. So you also believe that Christ died for your sins. He said, of course, because that's the foundation of his faith. That's the foundation of Christian Christianity. Paul says in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, if Christ is not risen from the dead, our preaching is vain, your faith is vain. Vain, useless, worthless, garbage. If this thing didn't happen, there is no Christianity. Christ must die and he must rise again. If not, there is no Christianity. That's what Paul says. And really, no Christian ever comes to our houses in my country. To teach us ethics, about morality, about hygiene, personal hygiene I'm talking about. No Christian. No Christian they teach me ethics, morality, hospitality, hygiene, nothing. He can teach me nothing. In my country I boast, South Africa, I come from South Africa, I boast that we Muslims, we have the lowest alcoholic consumption in the country. We have the lowest gambling rate in the country. We have the lowest suicide rate in the country. We have the lowest divorce rate in the country. We have the lowest prison rate in the country. And we have the highest charity rate in the country. There is not another nation in my country who can show a candle to us that we are better than you. And no nation, no community can show a candle to us that we are better than you. I feel it. But I might have, must have to apologize that still we don't get converts. Now the reason is, why would we get converts? No, we don't open our mouths. That's a problem. Anything you have, you have to sell. You have to talk. You don't talk, you don't sell. You have the Kohinu diamond. There's a way to market it. If you don't market it, you can't sell. So, that's the only drawback we have in South Africa, I'm talking about. So, what you do? This guy here now, how do you, he says, you also believe that Christ died for your sins? They must say yes. That is the common denominator. All whether Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Adventist, Baptist, whatever. If he is a Christian, he must believe that Christ died for his sins. So he said yes. You see, you know the answer beforehand. He said, you also believe that Christ died for your sins? Natural response, automatic. So yes. Third question, who is this Christ? 
This Christ we talk. Who is he? He said, Jesus. Look, he's playing into your hands. The guy did it to you. You believe in Jesus? You, you believe in his miraculous birth? You believe in his miracles? You believe his... Same thing you do to him now. Same thing. You also believe that he died for your sins? He said, yes. He said, who is this Christ? He said, Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. He said, yes, Jesus is the Christ. So when he was born, was he born Christ or was he born Jesus? Because Christ is a title. Like Bush, he wasn't Bush, born president, was he? Reagan, was he born president? No. At a certain stage in his life, the guy becomes a president, the other guy becomes a president. You become a principal of a school, you become a director. When? Were you born director? You born headmaster? No. You were born chairman? No. no. So, Jesus, when did he become the Christ? He wasn't born Christ because Luke, chapter 2 verse 23 I think he tells us, when he was eight days old, he was circumcised. And named Jesus by the angel when he was in his mother's womb. What was he named? Jesus. When? When he was in his mother's womb. He wasn't named Christ. Was he? No. When did he become the Christ? The anointed one. When? At the age of 30. He's baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist. And a voice is heard from heaven saying, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. From that day onwards he becomes the Christ, chosen one. Before that, if he had died, nobody would have heard his name. Before the age of 30, before his baptism, and before his, all these things happened the next three years, if those things didn't happen, you'll never hear about Jesus. If he died at the age of 12, you wouldn't hear. At the age of 20, if he died, you wouldn't have heard. You have to go through this complete cycle for you to hear about Jesus. So, at the age of 30, when he's baptized, from that day onwards, he becomes the Christ. So he claims to be the Christ. He didn't claim before that. In the temple at the age of 12, he didn't go and tell the priest, I'm the Christ. If he knew he was the Christ, he would have said so. He confounded the learned men in the temple, but he didn't say he was the Christ. From the age of 30 onwards, now he's making the claim that he is the Christ. Anointed by God, appointed by God. Now when he made such a claim, the Jews were not satisfied. They didn't like him for so many reasons. We won't go into that. But they didn't accept him. At his face value. He said, I am the Christ, the Messiah. So they came to him. The Jews, they came to him. As we read in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38, 39, 40. That's what you read in that little booklet, those three verses. And you have to memorize that. If you don't memorize that, you can't do the job. You just listening to me is entertainment. I'm entertaining you. If that's what you came here for, enjoy it. Enjoy it. But if you say, look, let's see what we can do. We are now in an ocean. You are in an ocean. If you are Muslim, you are in an ocean of Christianity. In South Africa, we are in an ocean of Christianity. In South Africa, we are less than 2%. Here too, I don't know how many percent you are. Of the population of America. 1%, 2%, I don't know. 4%? What? But we are in an ocean. In this ocean, either you sink or you swim. And to be able to swim, now you have to master this. And you have to put it on, apply it onto the other man. Now you ask him, so you see, when he claimed to be the Christ, the Jews came to him. And you have memorized those three verses. If you can't memorize, you are not the guy fit for battle. You might as well throw in the towel, keep away, keep away. You can't do the job then keep out of it. You keep on making salat, read that rosary, hope it saves you. It won't save your children, I tell you. It won't save your children from the Christian onslaught, that tasbih of yours, that beard of yours won't save you. You have to learn now to give battle, how to combat this new sickness that they are now wanting, man they are making in all our effort, all over the world. So you have to learn to give battle here at home. 
He says, they come to him and they say, Master, in the Hebrew language, there's a rabbi, we would have a sign of thee. We want you to show us a miracle. They want to see a miracle. Like the man flying in the air like a bird, walk on the water, give life to the dead, do something man, then we will know that we are a true man of God. What a way of judging a man of God. So Jesus reacts. He says, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Horrible people. You want me to show you some tricks? Standing on your head? What do you want? What do you want me to do? What do you want to do? An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. In common language, a bastard nation is looking for a sign. And there shall no sign be given unto it. Except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Only sign. No sign but one. No miracle except one. That's what he says. He doesn't say, you know, blind Bartimaeus, I healed him. You know that woman with issues, she was bleeding continuously and she touched me and she got healed. You know, I stilled the storm. You know, those 2,000 pigs I destroyed with one hit. Nothing, nothing. Only sign I'm prepared to give you is that of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. That's all. Is that the sign he gave? That's what it says. Only sign. So you're asking, what was the sign? Simple, simple. You master that little booklet. So what was that sign? Means what was that miracle of Jonah? Yunus. You say, Hazrat Yunus alayhi salam. What was his miracle? So if you read the little booklet, you can tell him now. He said, look, you go to your Bible. There's only one page in the Bible. Four short chapters, one page, that's a book. That's called a book. The book of Jonah is one page. In the whole Bible, it's hard to find. One page in 1,500 pages is hard to find. Jonah. But you don't have to go there. If you went to Sunday school, you will remember what I'm going to tell you now. He says, you see, Jonah was sent to the Ninevites. Don't worry about the name. Ninevites. He was told to go there and warn the people to repent in sackcloth and in ashes. Jonah, instead of going to Nineveh, he is despondent that these materialistic people, the evil, wicked and adulterous generation of his time, they will not listen to him, they will make a mockery of him. So instead of going to Nineveh, he goes to Joppa, modern Joppa. And he takes a boat and is running away. That's what his book says, the Bible, book of Jonah. So the at sea there is a storm. And according to the superstitions of these people, anybody who runs away from his master's command creates such a turmoil at sea. So they begin to question who can be responsible for such a turmoil. It's not abating. The storm is not abating. So Jonah realizes that he is a guilty man because he's running away from his master's command. God Almighty. God tells him, go Nineveh, and he's running away. So he volunteers. He says, look, I'm the guilty man. God is after my blood. And he's going to sing the boat to kill me. But in the process, you innocent people will die. Rather, you take me and you throw me overboard, and it will be all right for you. They say, no man. You know, you're such a holy man, godly person. Since you entered the boat, we can see you ever prayerful. You might be wanting to commit suicide, and you want us to help you. <laughs> we won't do that. We have our own system of finding out right from wrong. That is called casting the lot. Is like tossing the coin, head or tail, head or tail. And according to the system of tossing the coin, it's a casting of the lots, it came to the turn of Jonah that Jonah was the guilty man. So they took him and they threw him overboard. I'm st still reading the book of Jonah, that page, one page. But you'll find this all in that little booklet. So when they threw him overboard, the question arises, was he dead or was he alive? And I, because the man had volunteered. He said, look, make it easy for you. He volunteered. When a man volunteers, you don't have to strangle him before throwing. He says, no. If a man volunteers, you don't have to spear him before throwing. He says, no. You don't have to break his arm or limb. He says, no. So he was alive. They threw him into the sea alive. 
serious. And the storm subsided, says the book. Perhaps it was a coincidence. A fish comes and gobbles him. Dead or alive? Alive. Make him to say. You make him to say, dead or alive? First you make him, convince him and say, look, the man volunteered. If a man volunteers, then you don't have to do any harsh things to him. The man says, throw me. So they threw him. They don't have to do any harm. He is alive. Fish gobbles him, alive. From the fish's belly, the book says, that he prayed to God for help. Do dead people pray? Dead people, do they pray? No. So he was, get it from his mouth. Alive. Three days and three nights, the fish takes him around the ocean. Dead or alive? Alive. On the third day, one is on the seashore. Alive or dead? Alive. Look, the man told you. For as Jonah was, so shall the son of man be. Jonah is alive. According to your church, was Jesus dead or alive for three days and three nights? Dead. In your language, you English speaking people, in your language, is that like Jonah or unlike Jonah? Look, he failed. He said he'll be like Jonah and you telling me he was unlike Jonah. 1,200 million Christians say that he was dead, Jesus said he would be alive. I want to know who is lying, you or him. You are God lying or you 1,200 million Christian? You seven day Adventist and you Jehovah's Witness and you Baptist and the whole bang lot of you. Are you lying or he is lying? Your God is lying or you are lying? I want to know, tell me, who is a liar? You ask him, who is lying, you or him? You, the thousand million Christians or Jesus Christ, who is a liar? Look, it's as easy as that, Allah is easier. Simple, basic language. Like Jonah or unlike Jonah. But the clever fellow tells you, he said, no, 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 it was the time factor. So what's the miracle about the time factor? This is the time factor. You see, Jesus said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. He repeats the word three, four times. But he said, look, if a man is alive for three days or three nights, that's not a miracle. Miracle is, you expect a man to be dead and he's alive. That's a miracle. When you throw a man into a raging sea, he ought to die. If he died, it's not a miracle. A fish comes and gobbles a man. But the fish is no respecter of persons. He says, look, this is Jonah. I must take him nicely, gently. He mustn't get hurt. Hmm? Come, 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 come. No, a fish is no respecter. Look. That's a fish. That's how it takes the bait. Poor thing gets caught. That's how it gets caught. If it was a respecter of of your bait, he won't get caught. So, fish gobbles him, he ought to die. If he dies, it's not a miracle. Three days and three nights, suffocation and heat in the whale's belly, he ought to die. If he dies, it's not a miracle. Can't you see? It's a miracle of a miracle of a miracle. It's one of the most outstanding miracles of the Bible. Three times over. Three times over. Everything is a miracle. Surviving in the raging sea. Fish gobbles him. Three days and three nights suffocation and heat. Alive, alive, alive. There's no greater miracle than that. So Jesus says, what happens to Jonah happens to me. I will be like Jonah. Jonah is alive and Jesus is dead. He said he'll be like Jonah. You tell me he's unlike Jonah. What kind of religion have you got? Look my brothers and sisters. Get that little booklet from the Islamic Propagation Center. And if you have that patience and the perseverance, join the class. It's a privilege Allah has given you, Allah, that we, as small and as few as we are, we can do the job. You don't need any Arabs to come and help you, or any Pakistanis to come and help you. You can do it on your own with that little booklet. Master that little booklet, and now you look for the opportunity. People working with you, Christians, Christians all around you. Any excuse, in the buses, in the trains, wherever, Create an opportunity. Open your mouth. What church you belong to, sir? <laughs> Madam, what church you belong to? Let's. By God, the fellow won't know what hit him. And he won't know how things started. This is your privilege. Allah gives it to you. He says, He's given you a deen, a way of life, that is to master, overcome and supersede them all. Bulldoze them all.
wala ukarihul mushrikun now my how much the mushrik might not like it this is the destiny of his deen i started with that quran verse wala tarda anta al-yahud wala an-nasara hatta tatabiya millatan that the Jews and the Christians will never never be satisfied with you unless you follow the brand of religion now i say that this is from surah baqara in this encyclopedia called the quran it is in baqara how do we find baqara in this book huh that you know but the, you tell somebody else is now how do you find this suppose he doesn't know and you don't know how do you find bakara yes yes index there's an index in here at the back like a dictionary look for b bakara it will tell you two very easy to find it's aya number 120 very easy to find that's where you find it now this book is available i was happy i did know you see the way i was given to understand that there was some presentation of certificates in a classroom and i will go there and i said right i will sit down and watch the fun that's how we get caught out every time so i left everything behind i just come along with a, like a wise guy and they tell me that you're supposed to deliver a lecture so right okay <laughs> i can't say that look oh, so my bag is left in this hotel so, that's no excuse so i have to mm. but now this book here 1800 pages hard cover hard cover an encyclopedia how much 5 dollars i don't know how hard you feel have you ever purchased books for your children for your brothers at all little booklets for your children i know it cost hell of a lot in south africa cost more than this encyclopedia booklets for more than this encyclopedia booklets booklets books for the children This is five dollars for two, almost two thousand pages. And anything you want to know, everything is all here. Everything on your fingertips. What do you want to know? What do you want to know? You want to know about marriage? Open M. Tell you marriage. Everything about marriage in the house of Islam. You want to know about divorce? Open D. Tell you about divorce. You want to know about Jesus? Open J. Everything about Jesus. Everything on your fingertips. What do you want to know? Wallah you never had it so good you never had it so good and you never have it so good 5 dollars they are yours for the taking at the back and if you miss the bus in getting the book then the propagation center is there still they might have stocks you can get it from them 5 dollars you owe it to yourself to have one number one number two buy extra copies for your brother in laws muslim or non muslim for your brother in laws your father in law buy for them as well for your employer for your employee buy for them for your neighbor call them home for a cup of tea and at the end of it present them with a book look who can do better talking than allah we we'll make him to be your advocate he is your advocate he is talking on your behalf we you only just show him how to use the book see what about jesus see what it says and the j jesus his birth described in two places chapter 3 Verses 42 onwards. Chapter 19, verses 23 onwards. Let's have a look. Open chapter 3, verse 42, and start. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa yisqalat al-malaikatu ya Maryamu. If you know Arabic, read it. Read it to the non-Muslim. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Wallah, Allah's kalam has that magic powers. It has an impact which you can't get. You think wa yisqalat al-malaikatu ya Maryamu. The guy is going to laugh. He can't laugh. Voice call to the malaika to ya Maryam to behold the angel said oh Mary inna Allah astafaki wa tahharaki wa astafaki ala nisa al alamin that God almighty has chosen thee and purified thee chosen thee above the women of all nations such an honor is not to be found given to Mary the mother of Jesus even in the Christian bible show it to him let him know what this book says unfortunately we don't know it ourselves So acquaint yourself first. You acquaint yourself. Where it is? Where not? Read it. Master it. And every opportunity you get, call your neighbors, give them tea, give them samosas, and talk to them. And wallah, we can change this country. We can't fight. You can't fight and win. But you can conquer. You can conquer the hearts and minds of people. And once the man accepts your your deen, he becomes your slave. 
He becomes your slave. You don't have to learn to land on the moon or to go to the Jupiter and Mars probes. Probes. You don't have to do that. This guy will do it for you. And he will be the next guy who will land on Neptune. He will might be a Muslim going to give him a Zande. But you can make him to do that through this book. No other means. There's no guns can do that. This book will do the job. Wa Alhamdulillah. Sheikh Ahmed Dida, Jazakallah Khair. Uh, in fact, uh, Brother Dida came on Thursday and he did not know that what we are going to do. The next day we took him to the United Nations. Yesterday he was there, he offered his Juma prayers there and then he had to speak twice there. Now today we simply told him that there will be a award ceremony, that is the certificates will be distributed to the graduates, but now we ask him to speak. Uh, Brother Dida, we have a weakness. The more we hear you, we like to hear you all the more. Please forgive us. Now, I want to give him a little break and in the meantime, I would like to make a few announcements. Uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, we have a program in New Jersey. Uh, William Peterson College, 300 Pompton Road, Wayne, New Jersey. Inshallah, Brother Didat will speak there from 6 to 9. All are invited. And then, as most of us know, that on the 12th of November, Brother Didat will speak at Queen's College Golden Center, 12th of November, next Sunday, not coming Sunday, next Sunday. And the tickets for that, $5 each, are available outside the hall. Uh, the topic of his talk will be uh, the satanic verses written by Shaitan Rujdi, Salman Rujdi. <laughs> Sorry for that. Silly pop time. <laughs> now, brothers and sisters, uh, Islamic Center of Rockland cordially invites you to attend the fundraising dinner at Elks Lodge. The location is 82 Queens Boulevard, Elmhurst, New York. The date and time is Saturday, November 11th at 5.30 p.m. Sheikh Ahmad Didat, Sheikh Al Islam, will be the keynote speaker. And his talk will be Enjoying the Good and Forbid the Evil. Seats are limited and reservations are required. Donations are $50 per person or $200 per family. Uh, for more information, you can call Mr. Ziaullah 914, area code 425 2099, or Brother K. Fasihuddin 914 358 6642. I have to make another announcement, and this has given me uh, it's a painful announcement. We all know that in India there has been a continuing dispute on Babri Masjid. Now that dispute, that dispute comes, is coming to an end through terrorism. The Babri Masjid in India is being converted forcibly by Hindu terrorists to Rama Temple on November 9th. Thousands of Indian Muslims are being killed. The situation is very grave, a genocide is going on and the government of India seems to be helpless. To me, it is rather helping the Hindu terrorists. The Council of Muslim Organizations in New York are arranging a demonstration on Tuesday, November the 7th at 12 noon in front of Indian Consulate. The place is 64th Street East, 5th Avenue, in front of Indian Consulate, which is located at 64th Street East, 5th Avenue. And the time is 12 noon 
and it is on Tuesday, November the 7th. Please join the demonstration and show your support for this cause. And this announcement passed on to me also says that please request Brother Ahmad Didat to join us on Tuesday. Now, with these messages, uh, I will call the names of our graduates who have graduated from our classes at Masjid Al-Fatima this year and the brother and our sister, the recipient, will come uh, take the, uh, the certificate and he or she will be given two minutes time if he or she has to speak on any issue. Just a small talk. Uh, but before that, I would like to ask you, if you like, if you like to ask any questions from Sheikh Ahmad Dida. And the questions should be around the topic that what is the meaning and the significance and importance of the study of comparative religion. He has already given his message, but still, if somebody has a question, so please ask. So the person who wants to ask the question will come to this mic and Brother Dida, I will not give him a moderation to come here. He will answer your questions from that mic. Thank you. So any person who wants to come, please come forward. Sister, come. I prefer to stand here and show this, this a question that really bothers me, and it has to do with the Quran itself. And there's been question amongst the people here about giving out the Quran. As we understand, and some of us understand, and some of us do not understand that you can read Quran whether you're in wudu or whether you are not in wudu, but some people think that you have to be in wudu in order to read Quran, which is a misnomer. Okay, other people feel like if you're going to give the Quran since it's a glorious book that we shouldn't give it to non-believers because they, the, they don't have the same respect for the book as we do. And then therefore they won't make wudu in order to read the book. They won't read in the same language or even if they are Arabs and they read in the same language and they don't make wudu because they might not be Muslim that there's always a conflict of how to handle that book. Could you please clarify that for us, inshallah? This is quite an often asked question. That we Muslims, we are the handle in this so much this place. Utmost purity, ceremonial purity, wudu, all that is expected from us. What about the non Muslim? Now, the non-Muslim is not bound by our constitution. What is basically required is that his intentions are pure. In other words, he shows an interest. If you think that it will do benefit to the person by giving it to him, you give it. And Allah will not question you about that. What he does afterwards is his business. If he shows interest, you pay him. You try to create interest in him for the Quran, give it to him or to her. Now, I'm not trying to justify this because I noticed that some brothers and sisters, they picked up quite a few Quran from the, from the back. I don't know if you've got idea to give to non-Muslims or the other laws, sister laws, Muslims or not. I don't know. I said, even your employer, non-Muslim employer, or your employer is due to them. That's what I said. And I stand back. Now, I stand by that not because what I can make out of this. You can get what we are making out of this Quran. When you get 2,000 pages of my God, what a person can be making out of that? That you can get for yourself, you can get what you like. But this is what our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would do. I look at his example. You see, towards his last days on earth, when it was time for him to sit back and be high, the whole of Arabia was at his feet. It was only a question of polishing of the Muslims, making them better Muslims than what they were. And you can sit back, the job is done. The whole of Arabia accepted this stuff. 
that there are Muslims or Christians or what? The person said, Assalamu alaikum. So I said, no, so I said, what are you? What do I do? What do I do? Then again, it's common courtesy. In, in the African languages, I wish a man in his language. I wish him in his language. To the Christians, I said, good, good morning. To the Africans, I said, good morning. I said, good morning. To the Hindu, I said, salam, papa. I said, salam, papa. To the Surah, I said, salam, papa. I said, salam, papa. So now that guy wishes me in my language, I said, hmm? I will have it. How does it go? You wish him in his language, he said, good morning. He said, good morning. He said, good evening. He said, good evening. He says, how are you doing? <laughs> no, I, I think it's, it's a natural. Like they have it. I know they have now changed over to uh, Tuba al-Hayr. Allah tells the Quran to say, which is salam. And now they start saying Tuba al-Hayr, which is to say, good morning. I said, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'll keep you. Even Muslims, you don't need to go to the salam. This is Tuba al-Hayr. You know, it's good morning. So, we said, we'll keep you. Allah tells the Quran. If somebody wishes you, you wish him something better than that, or something equal. Nothing less. You can't wish anybody any less. If the man says, Salaam alaikum, if I can't say, Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. More than what you think of me, I bless him more. So please be also on you, this is of God, it's supposed to be upon you. If I can't do that, at least you are yourself. Only also because that's what Allah said. Wish something, something better, but at least something equal. I can't do something less or something worse. And that's my way of looking at it. Then if you can split days about this, <coughs> let them keep on splitting days. But your common sense tells you if somebody wishes you salam, you can't say I'm a Muslim. Allah tells you also that. Allah tells you also that. Allah tells you salam, Allah tells you. If somebody meets you, and you wish you salam, don't say you're not Muslim. Well, I'll tell you two words. So this is, don't say that you are not Muslim. I want, this is my, my, my way of doing it. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I want to know, because according to the Bible, they say that Jesus ascended to
This is the weapon that Allah has given you. We lose. You see, Allah tells you when they say, when they complain, وَقَالُوا They say, لَنْ يَلْكُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُدَى مَنْ أَسَارَ So they say that you Muslims will never, never enter Jannah until you become a Jew or a Muslim, you become a Christian. So Allah tells you an answer to that, we didn't have to go into, we didn't go into the talk. He says, تِلْكَ أَمَانِيُّهُ That this is the wishful thinking, vain desire, hallucination. قُلْ Allah, how do you have? Don't lose your proof. قُلْ Say, how do you have? Produce your proof in Tuntun Swati. Again, if you are speaking the truth, let us have a look at your authority. So the God produced the authority in 2000 different languages. This is my book. He says, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. My Bible says this, my Bible says that. But I, let's have a look at your Bible. So you are forced. What does it say? And it doesn't say what he's thinking. Let us reprove it. He says that Christ died, but Christ said he didn't be like Yoga. This Bible, they are proving your case from this Bible. Yes, you are yes. So if you can do that, then you can put away. Because this is what the Quran says this. Go ma katanu wa ma salatu. It's a very Quran kafra. Yes. It is a Quran that you don't believe in Muhammad. He said, I don't believe in it. Now what? Why? He said, I don't believe in it. This is the force. This is the copy. Don't believe in it. Muhammad copied it. So all of this one for the A and B. Let's see what you say. Look, you have understood your own language. Simple, basic English you don't understand. And with a challenge of literature, you can challenge it. Look, and read this. For as Job, like, for as Jonah was, so shall the son of man be. Like Jonah. You understand English? He said, yes. He said, he did not want to win We understand English. He said, for as Jonah was, like Jonah. He said, like Jonah or unlike Jonah. Little children like you. Can you go to the Is it like or unlike in your language? Is this a in your case? If you ask it, is this like in your life? Like or unlike? Is this unlike? So there's the answer. You are telling me that your, your God is alive. You are speaking the truth and your God is alive. What kind of religion is this God? This is a easy idea. Thank you. Some of the questions. I can want to ask you about uh, Surah Al-Fatiha. And um, some people, when they uh, recite Surah Al-Fatiha, they recite Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim as the first ayah. And some people, they recite Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen as the first ayah. Can you tell me if uh, both um, of those are correct or is it the uh, translator? Uh, in the Quran, as is here, yeah, this one. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is the first ayah of the Quran and the first ayah of the Quran in this Quran and I accept it as such. All the other basic things and all you only read it as an introduction and all that I said this is part of the surah and that's how I have understood it and I accept it as such. It's an ayah of surah al The first ayah is Bismillah. Shukran. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, the last question because uh, we are short of time and the authority is here, they ask us to close the function and we have to distribute the certificate so you can ask the question and all the rest of the questions will be answered later on because Brother Ahmed Bilal has so many programs so you can go there and ask the question. You can ask the question. Uh, the question is, um, was Navi Isa have ever put on a cross and a bow of the Bible said about him producing the proof by saying, touch me, feel I'm, I'm flesh. Did this ever come to happen? Yeah, the first that you have just alluded to is in the Bible. Yeah. And we may dealing with, with this problem. According to what I just explained in the previous question, Allah says, Kul ha kul ha. Produce your proof. Asking the enemy, the opposition, is making certain claims. Christ died. Your book says, Wama katu, Wama salabu. I don't accept your book. My book says this. Let's say, look. Allah says, asking for his proof. So he produced it. So now we are reasoning with him. According to his proof, 
when he says, Jesus says, you know, when he came to the temple room, said, you hold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see, for the spirit that no flesh and bones will have to see. Yeah. So we are asking, what is it like to prove? See, our problem is, did he or did he die? If he died, Christianity is based on the death and resurrection of Jesus. As I told you, the first of all, for instance, that if Christ is not risen from the dead, that if he didn't die, he didn't wake up, there is no Christianity. That's all. So that means there is nothing there. Prove that from his own book. That's what we are proving. That the man says, I am the same fellow of man, what's wrong with you? Handle me and see. I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook, I'm not a person of my body, I'm not a transgender body, I'm not a man of a body, I'm the same kind of man who look at me. So in this proof that the whole religion So if the whole religion falls, then you do your job, you are still here. What do you really think? I have one more question. Um, what about this? Can the Sufi of you as well? No, I'm not a Sufi. Uh, that's not right here. Sufi is not right no, okay. Now, I request uh, Brother Hamza Akhim Wali to help Brother Ahmad Lila in the distribution of certificates. So I am calling the names. Please come forward, receive your certificate, and if you have to say something, you can just communicate the message in two minutes because uh, the time is very limited. Uh, brother Abdul Haq. Brother Abdul Haq. including Brother Hamza, Brother Ahmed Didad, and especially the students of Brother Hamza to do the job, to invite people with excellent words to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amen. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Assalatu Wassalamu ala Sayyidil Musaleen, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmeen, amma ba'd. 
Um, I'd like to take this time to thank the IPC Center, IPCI. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Brother Ahmadidat here, who is our forerunner, pioneer in this field of comparative study. Without him, a lot of things couldn't be possible, initiative, spirit. Most of all, I'd like to thank the Brother Hamza Abdul Malik, who has been my tutor for a number of years. And uh, he has not only assisted me in this field of comparative study, he has also assisted me in other areas of my Islam and my growth. And I reflect on this, and it brings a point of giving dawah and the purpose of giving dawah and not just leaving the person that you give the dawah to unattended. Because we as Muslims, we believe in the Quran as our guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as Muslims and having faith, which comes to two aspects, the laws and the ordinances and the practice of the laws and the ordinances, these two together and join make up our faith. So when we read the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, He says, Thy duty is to deliver the message, and our duty is to call them to account. So as Muslims, we must deliver the message. We must take upon ourselves to give the da'wah. And there, in the Quran, Allah has given us the methodology in which to call our Christian brethren and others to the way of Islam. And chapter 16, verse 125, and it says, Call to the way of your Lord in wisdom and goodly exhortation, and argue with them in the best manner. Allah has also enjoined on us in the Quran, in Surah Kaf, He says, And warn those who say, Allah has begotten a son. So with this instruction in the Quran and our duty as Muslims, we must devise a plan using Quran as premises to establish a methodology in delivering this message to our Christian brethren. Because if we don't, if we don't give the da'wah, if we don't deliver the message, what's not used, waste away. We become like a piece of bread. If you ever sat a piece of bread on the counter, after a while it dries up and withers away. And we as Muslims, in order to regenerate, revive, and group and receive the blessings of Allah, we must follow the instructions as He has issued out in the Quran. A few years ago, a few years ago, I um, myself was content with going to Juma, going to work, and making Salah. And through these brothers here, that who took the time and took the dedication and took the patience to teach this class, I have learned the importance of giving da'wah. So with this, I'd like to say thank you to all, first of all to Allah, and thank you to, for all that have made it possible for me to acquire this knowledge. And thank you all for attending this graduation. Alhamdulillah. Brother Mustafa Asad Abdullah Muhammad, Brother Zafarullah, Brother Bashiri Abdul Rab, just two minutes, you can finish. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I just want to say something very quickly uh, that uh, I have taken this course and I learned a lot from it. And I feel. and devoted defender of the faith whose beneficent influence has inspired and ennobled a generation of men and women 
in grateful appreciation of his devotion to Allah the Almighty and his tireless service to humanity, uh, November 1989. Sheikh Ahmad Didat, respected brothers and sisters, so now I thank you again for joining us and making this program a success. So before we leave, I will say the dua, Rabbana la tazik kulubana baada is hataytana wa havlana milla dunka rahma inna ka antal wahab. Allah Hafiz. Thank you.